Francisco. I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at Lenox Hill. This is being brought to you by the Journal of Neuro-Oncology and Lenox Hill Neurosurgery. Uh, and today we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Rodney Wegner from the Allegheny uh, Health Network is with us to discuss a recent paper published in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology. Uh, I'm with us as usual, um, Gautam Mehta's here. It looks like Jason's uh, a little bit behind, but he'll be here soon. And uh, I mean, we might as well just jump right into it. Actually, we're, we John Bookfar is with us today too, which is fantastic, so. Awesome. Well, Dr. thanks Wagner. for having me. I was uh, pleasantly surprised to get the invitation to come on here and excited to share our paper with you guys. No, I appreciate it. So I'll give you a little background on what we're doing, but basically we uh, give authors the opportunity to discuss, you know, the reasons, the results, and the relevance of the papers they recently published, uh, obviously focused on brain and spine tumor disease and neuro-oncology. But uh, we appreciate your time, so why don't we, why don't we dive right in? Sure. So just background on me, I'm a radiation oncologist here in Pittsburgh, Allegheny Health Network, and I do a lot of uh, gamma knife radio surgery, so that's kind of my clinical background. So the background for this study, melanoma accounts for probably, you know, 10 percent thereabouts of patients with brain metastases. It's one of the most common malignancies to metastasize to the brain along with lung and breast cancer. Traditionally, brain mets have been treated with surgery plus or minus radiation, whether it was radio surgery or whole brain radiation. If you look at older studies dating back to the 90s and early 2000s, uh, overall survival was pretty abysmal in the four to six month range. In the past eight to 10 years, immunotherapy and targeted therapy has emerged in terms of treatment options for patients with stage four melanoma, and it does have some CNS penetration and has improved overall outcomes in this patient population, uh, you know, closer to a year, or maybe even 18 months in, in uh, well-selected patients. A little bit more background. I think all of us know that in terms of local control of radio surgery for melanoma brain meds, we can expect outcomes in the 80 to 90% range, and that certainly goes, uh, is based on data uh, dating back to the 90s with gamma knife. Looking at BRAF MEK inhibitors and immunotherapy, which both have CNS penetration, there's some prospective data, certainly small series, but that show that response rates in the 55 to 60 percent range uh, for untreated brain mets, so no radiotherapy in those patients. So the next question naturally becomes when and should we emit radiation for these patients? And some of the more recent guidelines say perhaps for small asymptomatic I would say numerous brain mets, patients that definitely need whole brain radiation, or patients who have asymptomatic brain mets and significant extracranial disease burden where obviously they need systemic therapy, otherwise uh, they may end up passing away. So the way we went about trying to answer or provide some data to answer this question was to the use of the National Cancer Database. So we examined patients who had brain mets from melanoma, all of who had immunotherapy, and then we created two cohorts, one that had radiotherapy to the brain and one that did not. And then we wanted to look at difference in outcomes. Just a couple of slides on the NCDB in case uh, people aren't aware of what it is. It's a large national cancer registry, which is managed by the American College of Surgeons and the Commission on Cancer. It covers over 1,500 cancer centers in the United States. It's important to note that it collects only upfront diagnostic and treatment information on these patients uh, with newly diagnosed malignancies. It has a whole slew of information on socioeconomic data points, so location of the patient, what type of facility they're treated in, whether it's an academic center or a community center, what type of insurance they have. They are able to estimate educational level by percent of patients in that zip code without a high school diploma. Similarly, they can do uh, income um, assessments based on their zip code. There's a large amount of treatment and staging data as well. It's uh, obviously CNM staging, both clinical and pathologic. They do have primary disease site surgery uh, for most disease sites. Interestingly, for brain meds, obviously, there is uh, then not any kind of surgical data, which is a limitation. The radiation is really well documented in the NCDB. They have the type of radiation, the technique, what target or anatomic site was treated the dose and number of fractions. They also have days to start of radiation. They also have information on immunotherapy and chemotherapy. It's essentially though just a yes or no column uh, for that data point. So it doesn't tell you what immunotherapy was given, how many cycles were given or anything of that nature, unfortunately. Back in 2010, the NCDB started documenting patients who had uh, metastatic disease at diagnosis and they have uh, codes for lung mets, liver mets, brain and bone mets. The only outcome in the NCDB, again, a, a pretty big limitation, is overall survival. So we have no toxicity data, no local failure, no distant failure, and unfortunately, no salvage therapy data. 
So what we did is we looked at the melanoma database, which actually went back to 2004, but as I said, they didn't start documenting brain meds until 2010, so that already knocked off a big chunk of patients. For this study, they all had to be treated with immunotherapy with or without brain-directed radiation. Uh, the STATS program I use is MedCalc, and we did a multivariable logistic regression to identify predictors of immunotherapy treatment alone compared to immunotherapy with radiation. We also did a multivariable COX regression to look for predictors of survival. And then we did this propensity score propensity match, which is kind of popular with these NCDB analyses. And for those, when you do the logistic regression, it can actually generate a propensity score, so a score that indicates likelihood of immunotherapy treatment alone. We then do a case control matching on an exact match on the propensity score, and then run, run a Kaplan-Meier analysis on that match set of patients. So the entire data set is really big, which is one of the uh, strengths of the NCDB. So the, the data set going back to 2004 is over half a million patients. But given the, uh, the time constraints, and the fact they didn't start documenting until 2010, it quickly cut it down to 3,000 patients, and we removed patients who did not have brain radiation or, or brain radiation without immunotherapy. And then we also used a cutoff of at least one month of follow-up uh, to account for a moral time bias. So we ended up with just shy of 700 patients, and most of them were treated with brain radiation and immunotherapy, and 142 patients were treated with immunotherapy alone. Most of the patients were male. The median age was 62, but did span the ages of 20 to 90. Almost everybody was Caucasian. There was a relatively even split of government insurance and private insurance. Almost two thirds of patients were treated at academic centers. The vast majority had extracranial metastatic disease. So the way we uh, calculated that was if a patient had brain meds and for example, lung meds or liver meds coded for, we counted that as extracranial metastatic disease. Most patients did not receive traditional chemotherapy. In terms of the breakdown of patients receiving brain radiotherapy, it was a relatively even split between whole brain radiation and radiosurgery. Median follow-up was 10 months for the entire cohort. In terms of radiation, pretty standard dosing for a whole brain radiation, 30 gray, 10 fractions was the median, and for radiosurgery, it was 22 gray in a single fraction, which is pretty standard based off the old RTOG guidelines. And time to radiation was just over a month, and time to immunotherapy was uh, closer to three months. The only predictor on a multivariable logistic regression of treatment with immunotherapy alone was a comorbidity score of zero, which is a better performing patients. Um, score two was not Rodney, significant, which is, uh, sure. Rodney, do you think that's, um, that's just due to the side effect profile of the immunotherapy? I found that interesting. <clears throat> yeah, it was interesting too that nothing else really kind of played out. I'm not sure it's related to that. Um, because this comorbidity score is pretty kind of rough around the edges. It's like literally if patients have coronary heart disease and diabetes and hypertension and things like that. So it's pretty general. It's not very specific. Yeah. And a lot of those things wouldn't preclude immunotherapy. Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, and, it, it's, and no problem. I mean, the other thing along those lines is you would think that maybe the younger patients or older patients maybe would be treated with immunotherapy alone or radiation alone, et cetera, you know. Yeah. And that didn't play out in the stats. In terms of predictors for survival, no surprises here. Patients who had extracranial mets had a higher risk of death, hazard ratio 1.77. And then interestingly, patients who were treated at academic centers were less likely to die from disease compared to those not treated there. And of course, that might be a surrogate for better performers, people with more resources, access to clinical trials, things like that. And obviously then the uh, combination immunotherapy, radiotherapy, there was no difference in survival compared to uh, immunotherapy alone. So we did the propensity match. And if you recall, there were 142 patients who got immunotherapy alone. So we were able to generate 141 matched pairs, ran the Kaplan-Meier analysis, and essentially the median survival was 11 months uh, regardless of treatment. So we thought it would be interesting then to break it down and look at patients who had radiosurgery and immunotherapy and then uh, separately do whole brain radiotherapy and immun immunotherapy. And looking at the radiosurgery cohort, those patients had a median survival of 19 months compared to about a year for immunotherapy alone, and that was statistically significant. And then looking at whole brain radiotherapy, kind of flipped the curves, and patients treated with whole brain radiotherapy and immunotherapy had a worse survival compared to immunotherapy alone, also statistically significant. So what we con concluded from the study was that it might be reasonable to emit brain radiation in certain patients, so small, numerous, asymptomatic METs, which would require whole brain radiotherapy. 
And obviously, as we mentioned, extensive extracranial disease, which would require urgent systemic therapy. Uh, based on our subset analysis, radiosurgery and immunotherapy appears to possibly improve outcomes. Again, accounting for uh, some of our obvious selection bias, those patients probably have limited lesions, are getting better radiation, probably have a better performance status. And then the limitations, uh, which are pretty much standard across most national cancer database reviews, uh, number, of volume, number and volume of lesions in the brain is not recorded, which obviously would affect the choice of whole brain radiation versus radiosurgery, whether patients had symptomatic disease or asymptomatic disease. We have no idea which patients had any kind of neurosurgical intervention, if at all. We don't know the type of immunotherapy that we use, number of cycles. And obviously, salvage therapy would be important because if somebody got immunotherapy and then progressed and got whole brain or radiosurgery, it would be good to know that and see if that affected outcome. And then toxicity as well, because sometimes these immunotherapies do have uh, significant toxicity. The other thing, all of these patients had brain metric diagnosis, which is not what we see in clinic all the time. A lot of patients with melanoma will start out stage two or three and then progress to brain meds maybe 12 to 18 months later. So can, cannot necessarily extrapolate these results to that population either. And then NCDB does not uh, document BRAF status or PDL1 status. Thanks. No, that's great, Rodney. Thanks so much for, for joining us and uh, presenting this fantastic work. Um, you know, this obviously you know, brings to mind a, a bunch of questions. This is obviously a controversial kind of subject and people have gone back and forth on the role of radiosurgery and whole brain for the use in melanoma and especially melanoma metastases. I guess the big question for me is, is at this point, you know, stereotactic radiosurgery is showing uh, significant improvements and so, you know, why, why not include stereotactic radiosurgery in, in basically every case, especially as the numbers, you know, as the studies keep coming out that suggest we can increase the numbers of lesions targeted? I, I agree, Honor, what's been 100 percent, especially uh, I think there's some emerging basic science data, too, that says if you do higher than normal dose radiation like radiosurgery prior to immunotherapy, it might actually prime the immune system and improve outcomes. So it would be kind of interesting to look at it, you know, maybe time from radiosurgery to immunotherapy and see if there's any kind of interval that corresponds with uh, the outcomes. Yeah. Well, also, you know, now that you mention it, it, can we find a happy medium on dose? Do we need to go so high or does the, uh, is there a synergistic effect where you can lower the dose and maybe not get as much radiation necrosis or kind of limit the effects of that? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I guess at this point, you know, what, and you may have mentioned it, but just because, you know, this is kind of an informal discussion and, the, and we have patients listening as well, you know, what do you consider now an indication to continue whole brain? Uh, our institutional practice here is if somebody has uh, 10 or more brain meds up front and does not receive whole brain radiotherapy before, of course, you can always make, I think, the, uh, the argument for melanoma that it's probably not going to respond to 30 gray and 10 fractions no matter what's there. So, our practice is to maybe do whole brain up front, uh, hippocampal sparing if we can, if insurance will allow it, uh, throw in the Menda mm -hmm. as well if the insurance will allow it, and then maybe do a short interval MRI at four to six weeks, and if there's anything that's still kind of festering there, boost that with the radiosurgery. So you guys are still using it pretty frequently then? Yeah, yeah. So on the, on the you flip guys? side, um, so you, you talked about kind of the, the follow-up and, and um, uh, observation period for if you uh, if you just do the whole brain, but uh, with immunotherapy alone, there's going to be a fair number that progress afterwards. Um, you know, after treatment, I think even uh, in kind of the carefully selected groups like the the Tabi paper in New England Journal where they had combinatorial checkpoint inhibitors, still uh, objective response rates were like in the mid 50s. Um, yeah. And uh, and we had uh, we had looked at the outcomes of uh, brain. Uh, uh, adoptive cell transfer immunotherapy for uh, brain mets at the NCI and found that the um, untreated uh, or previously untreated lesion uh, prior to immunotherapy was uh, the site of first in initial progression uh, after immunotherapy in 61% of patients. So these, these untreated, um, primarily untreated lesions are probably very likely to progress. Do you guys have, if you do immunotherapy alone, um, and these patients progress, would the next step be whole brain radiotherapy? Um, is there a follow-up period for those as well? 
I mean, for us, we've just been we're using a, re a relatively arbitrary cutoff of 10, regardless of histology. So if somebody had like 15 to 20 brain meds, got immunotherapy up front and unfortunately progressed, we would proceed with whole brain radiotherapy first. And I've seen that happen like twice, probably in the past six months. Yeah. But, but How does this... Go ahead. Go ahead, Gavin. Sorry. No. No, no problem. But I, regardless, I, I think this is kind of the holy grail of where we want to get to if we can avoid whole brain radiotherapy. It's been very effective for um, targeted therapy for uh, lung cancers and, you know, kind of moving away from whole brain therapy uh, as, a, as a first line. And, and so I, I think this, this is very provocative, or your paper is very provocative, but I think it's provocative in a good way. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think you've done a marvelous job with the paper and, and uh, able to, to draw some conclusions in a way that I think would have been much more challenging to do and even potentially problematic to approve patients to uh, an RCT in the current environment, you know, with uh, equipoise and other sorts of uh, things now uh, causing patients to really begin to, to question whether or not they want to have whole brain radiation therapy, especially if they've got small numbers of metastatic uh, tumors, uh, mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, and they've got immune checkpoint inhibitors, they've got uh, radiosurgery as options. I, I uh, want to highlight, there was a paper that we published in Journal of Neuro-Oncology not that long ago. Uh, they did talk a little bit about the, um, about the upregulation of, of genes associated with with radiosurgery that could uh, that could lead to an apoptotic cascade uh, that would then potentially be leveraged by uh, systemic therapies, including uh, uh, targeted therapies and immune checkpoint inhibitors. So I do think that there are some options for patients where you can really leverage the um, the radiosurgery with the immune checkpoint inhibitors. I'm wondering what your your institutional uh, your your relative institutional experiences are uh, amongst the panelists about when to give immune checkpoint inhibitors with in relationship to the timing of radiosurgery. Do you give them before, do you give them concurrently, or do you give them after radiosurgery in patients with metastatic melanoma? I think we've at least anecdotally been trying to do it afterwards if we can, if we can see the patients uh, before they start the immunotherapy, just based on that emerging data that you mentioned. And that's what we've been doing too, uh, you know, in short order. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think that uh, one wants to wait too long, but we prefer to give the radiosurgery before uh, the immunotherapy. If they've been on it before and they've progressed, then we'll keep it going. We may obviously change things up or add dual uh, immunotherapy over a, a, a single modality approach. Uh, Jason, I'm glad, I'm welcome by the way. I, I know you missed the beginning part of this, but um, good to have you on board. What, what about your practice? Uh, I know you do a lot of radio surgery. Um, are you doing radio surgery pretty much up front, or is there anyone in your practice just doing immunotherapy? Uh, no, there are some patients where we will consider doing immunotherapy, but to, to Godon's point, I think that you, that the data suggests a response rate of probably around mid fifties at at the six month time point. And and, and you, as you know, uh, certain patients with favorable mutations, BRAF uh, mutations, are 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 going to exceed that six month median survival. And uh, I think in your study, um, you showed some some appreciable long-term survivors in the patients that were treated with SRS and immune checkpoint inhibitors so that many of those patients would, would not be well controlled with immunotherapy alone. It's always difficult to predict though who the long-term survivors will be. And uh, so I, I would, would say that if patients are just receiving immune checkpoint inhibitors in general, they're gonna be patients who have limited numbers of a, a smaller number, smaller overall volume and really may be asymptomatic and that that will be following those patients closely and the signs of progression uh, will will go ahead and, and treat them but I, we also have a low threshold to to, uh, to treat and we have a, a multidisciplinary brain metastasis board that meets every Friday so uh, we we can discuss cases at least once a week if not more often and uh, those those sorts of patients where we may hold back on radiosurgery are, are, are going to have a, a be 
brought back to a multidisciplinary discussion in short order if they show signs of progression. Yeah. So, As, uh, uh, Randy, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for uh, Jason and Rodney. Um, in some of our glioblastoma patients, we augment when, we're, when we decide if it's a hypermutable tumor um, or they're PDL1 positive, which is extremely rare, we have them get tetanus toxoid um, immunoadjuvant injections monthly, almost to stir up an ascopal effect. Do you know, are you, are you guys using immunoadjuvants like that? Do you send your patients ever uh, when they're on immunotherapy? to heighten the escopal effect with something as simple as getting a tetanus toxoid every month? I have not seen that in our practice here in Pittsburgh, at least. We're not doing that as a matter of routine, but I would say that uh, I, I can understand the rationale behind it. And I think that there, you know, there have been a number of studies that have pointed to the, um, the importance of the immune response, both in metastatic melanoma as well as in primary brain tumors, specifically glioblastomas. So that I, I think that there's little harm uh, in doing what, uh, what you're doing and probably a, a reasonable chance of benefiting these patients, but obviously more, more study needs to be done. Right, but, I think, right, the, you know, the vaccine patients or, or the melanoma patients that have 125 mutations, you know, they're very, very high mutation burden. Just something to consider because Otherwise, uh, you know, the, the immunotherapy agent just may not take hold. And I, I love the idea of uh, radio surgery to, to harness that escopal effect and to augment it. But it's just a, a thought that we have in, in, um, in treating some of these. It sure is harmless. Yeah. So Rodney, just to keep going, I guess, um, how does this change your practice? Have you guys made uh, efforts to, to move to different treatment paradigms based on the results of this paper? Are you looking for further evidence? Uh, I would think this is just kind of more hypothesis generally, at least for our practice at this time. And uh, the medical oncologists at TMOS and the melanoma are still kind of pushing ahead with, with trying to give more immunotherapy up front. I mean, most of the patients do get discussed prospectively though. So if, if I'm at the tumor board or my partner's there, we can try to make a case to, to get these patients treated aggressively up front with radiosurgery. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think it's fantastic. Um, as always, this is open to questions from uh, viewers as well, if anyone has anything. Otherwise, we like to keep these limited to about 30 minutes. It keeps people interested. It keeps everyone fresh. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate your time. Uh, fantastic work. Thanks again to uh, Gautam and Jason and uh, John Bokfar for coming along for the ride. And uh, this will be posted on our YouTube page um, probably by tomorrow or the next day. So anyone who missed it, you guys can, you know, pass it around and let people see. Um, the only other thing I wanted to plug this week is that we are hosting a summer seminar series for students called Brain Turns here at Lenox Hill. It's a virtual seminar. Um, so if you guys want to pass it along to any students or uh, it's really high school and above, high school, college, medical students. And um, it's about eight weeks, so about three hours a day of, you know, a diverse curriculum in medicine, um, really ranging from everything from, you know, the, uh, the administrative staff to advanced care practitioners to neurosurgery. Obviously, there's a heavy neurosurgery slant. But it's looking like it's going to be a fantastic program. And so I just wanted to plug that. The link will be in um, my bio on Instagram and Twitter and uh, Facebook uh, probably by the end of today. And it'll stay there for about a week. Next week, uh, we'll be back. Uh, same, same place, same time. And hopefully another great discussion. So thanks, everyone, for coming along. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Andy. Great job, Randy. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Thanks, Randy. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.